allow me to read a scripture, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I'm not going to unpack all the context of this, but there's a conversation there between a prophet named Habakkuk. It's a strange name. I know, and I haven't heard of anybody naming their child that, but Habakkuk, this conversation goes on between this prophet and Almighty God, which started with some complaining, some negativity on the prophet's part. And the people are in crisis due to the Babylonian captivity, which leads to a conversation. And I will tell you, there are pressure points in our culture today. If you're listening to the news every day, be careful. It can get overwhelming. Am I right? People pick that that negativity up all the time. And, And as Christians, we have hope. I said, we have hope. We have hope today. Can we give the Lord praise? We have hope today. We have absolute hope. So the prophet's complaining about his unbelievable circumstances, his unheard prayers in chapter 1, the unseen responses as he blames God. And, 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 and un, un, as a result of the prayers, he doesn't see or hear anything happening. And it all leads to him having these unfair conclusions. It's a cycle that we can get caught up in. I heard a good message this week that really kind of hit me up at Praise and Prayer Conference and it talked about Samson chasing foxes. Here's this all, almighty warrior had a holy assignment to be a warrior and he's out here chasing foxes. We can do that. And I think that's what I had to evaluate in my own life during this, during this time off. Am I chasing foxes, chasing details where we need to let the Lord lead us and fulfill our holy assignments that God has for all of us? Listen to some highlights from the conversation in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I'm just going to hit a few. I won't read every line. But the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry? Do you not see me crying? And you will not hear, even cry out to you. I mean, I'm not just crying to anybody. I'm crying out to you. And there's nothing happening. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble instead? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. You ever feel like that in our culture today? Get in the church as well. Therefore, the law is powerless. Justice never seems to go forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Look among the nations and God, God look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. God comes back with a statement. All right, man, you feel pretty bad. Look at the nations. I'm doing something bigger that you're completely unaware of. Can I tell you that God is moving in our lives at times and we're completely unaware of it? We get so locked in on things and negativity and things going on and all the details we're surrounded with and we forget that God is really up to some big things. And he lets Habakkuk know that. I'm going to work a work in your days that you will not believe if I were to tell you or unpack it. Now the problem is a lot of preachers want to preach this verse and they talk about, oh, vision, this work's going to be amazing. But what God is saying, you think it's bad now, it's about to get worse. I'm going to give you a vision. And you're not going to like the vision. I mean, you never hear anybody talk about that kind of thing today. It could get worse before it gets better. But it doesn't matter because the bottom line is God's got us. And God will see us through whatever we go through. So listen to some highlights from this conversation and, and, and read them. The conversation the prophet had with God led to a sabbatical. Habakkuk has to go on a sabbatical. And he takes the words of the Lord and he gets disturbed and he says, okay, here's what I'll do in chapter two. I'm going to get a little higher. I'm going to go to a place where I'm going to shut myself away and I'm going to seek your voice and I'm going to step back instead of judging. I'm going to try to hear and see what you're up to. Let me just tell you that's good for all of us. A little bit of that is good for all of us. Shutting off the radio, shutting off the voices. I'm going to say it, shutting off other preachers. Some of you listen to so many messages a day, you can't remember which one preached which by the end of the day. And it feels good. But are you hearing from the Lord? Are you hearing what he has to say? Are you dependent upon preachers to hear and teachers to hear what you're supposed to be hearing? That's a good thing at times, especially if you're part of a fellowship. But you've got to be careful. You're hearing everything out there. Am I okay? So, there's a reset. The Lord then answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on the tablets that he may run that reads it. You get the rest of the verses. Simply put, there's things I've learned from this sabbatical. First, it's good to take some time away. Pretty simple. It's good to take some time away. I hadn't done a whole lot of that, especially since we started all the building on the campus. Debbie reminded me, you haven't been taking time away. 
I think she talked to the staff. She says she didn't, but I wonder. It's good to take some time away. Does anybody agree with that? Why? First of all, to reflect. That's what you see going on here in chapter 2. There's some reflection. To reflect. Where have we been? What has been going on? Um, can I tell you that there's times that when you get back, step back, and reflect, you can see patterns in your life? You see these same patterns in Scripture? Sometimes it starts with trouble. You think everything's going great, and all of a sudden it starts with trouble. Anybody ever had trouble in your life? Some of you are lying, but some of us are honest. You ever had trouble in your life? A major setback, a disappointment, something you were counting on, hoping for, and trouble hits. Trouble. And then it moves from trouble to a test. And then it moves from a test to tiredness and weariness. There's patterns that we go through, and sometimes we don't step back and look at what, what's going on. And that's what we see happening here to Habakkuk. And, and, and I remember questioning. When I first heard this in August, I think it was, it was past appreciation, and some said, we, 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 want to, we, we would really want you to take a sabbatical. And what I was hearing, they were sneaking in our leadership groups and promoting this, and everybody was on board for it. And I'm going to be honest with you. I asked myself, do I really need this? Do I need this? I mean, rhythm, breaking rhythm is hard sometimes. I mean, I can tell you what I'm doing on specific days as I focus on certain things each day. I break that rhythm. Got it with a high, is that really going to be good? I don't feel tired, and I didn't feel that tired. I'm, I, 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 I sleep well at night. Do I need this? And as I got looking back, as I stepped back that first couple of weeks, I stepped back and I got thinking about 2018 and how we started to build out our campus. And we started adding to some of the buildings that were already here through partnership, but we started, we went to the student, student center, I think in 2014, 16, then we kept, we kept building, the, started building the campus out. And, and I got thinking about, that was a little tiring on all of us, wasn't it? I got thinking about the development. I got thinking about how COVID hit in 2020. That was not fun. In fact, it was aggravating. I had forgotten about it until I stepped back and reflected, but I almost quit one Sunday morning. Actually, it's Tuesday morning. And I told Debbie, I told this probably a few years ago, I'm done. We've been marked by the media. I'm not trying to get sympathy. I'm just telling you, trouble, trial, test. I was ready to walk away. Some of you would have been fine with that. Some of you may not have been fine with that. But I was troubled. I thought, this is it. And boy, Debbie, as only she can do, looks at me and said, did you hear that from God? I didn't even like the question because I'd made my mind up. You can get tired and weary and not even realize it. I remember looking back at that time and construction delays, couldn't get workers on the project, went past the time we were supposed to get in here. Then we're ready to go in. COVID numbers are down. What happens? I'm going to say it. All the hell breaks loose. I thought it was bad before. I'm going to give you a vision. It's going to get worse. What do you do when tomorrow's worse than today? Do you have enough faith to hold you in? Do you still have faith that says he is and hope says that he can and trust says that God knows best? We just sang about trust. We glibly sing about such things, but do we have that internal thing going on that says, I've got faith. I know God is. Regardless of the circumstances, he still is. That's faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to get there. Our God, our God, that's faith. You may tell us to bow. You may tell us we're going to die and burn in a fiery furnace. But our God, our God still exists. No matter what happens, our God is faith. Our God is able, is hope. Our God is able. Hope says he can. Regardless of what happens, he can. Our God is able to deliver us. But if not, some of you faith people don't like that. The but if not. Thy will be done. Oh, but God's got a promise. No, I don't, I don't want to hear that. Oh, I don't care what you want to hear. God has a way of saying, I know best. My timing is always right. I'm teaching. I'm doing things that you don't know. You may look through your little lens and think you got faith, but faith is trusting God, marrying trust, and saying that God always knows best. Can we give him praise that we can take confidence in that today? Yes, he always knows best. And please know me, I'm not throwing it off on people that have faith. I'm just saying it gets misappropriated sometimes. Because you have faith doesn't mean you're God. 
God always has a right to call the shots he wants to call because he's God. You believe that today? Um, trouble. Parking lot worship. You may have liked that. I heard a lot of good things. I didn't. And then tired. 2020, middle of 2020, was done, test trials. Habakkuk 1.5 says it gets worse. There's media attacks, politics. I didn't say a whole lot about it. I alluded to it. We had people leave because I wasn't strong enough on masks. And I didn't do anything that our leadership didn't want us to do. We were getting counsel every week. And then we had people leave because we were too strong on masks. We had people who felt awkward because they would see people here with masks. I'm going to tell you, that's the dumbest thing. There's things that divided the body of Christ during that time that I, I can't believe it. We talk about immaturity. I'm going to say it. Immaturity and covenant. Well, bless God, brother, you don't... Yeah, I do understand. I had to live with it. People will leave. And we didn't say, have to wear a mask, don't have to wear a mask. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. If you want to stay home, stay home. Nobody told you what to do, but people were sideways. We better be careful with this political season because division's coming. Division's coming. There are people that will judge you because of the president you're going to vote for. It might be best to keep that to yourself, by the way. At least keep it off social media. Please help us. Stay off social media during this time. Boy, somebody needs to praise the Lord for that. Get off social media during this time. Nobody's reading your stuff anyway. You think everybody's reading it? Nobody gives a rip. I tell you, it's good to be back. I'm feeling it. <laughs> stuff I wanted to say for a few weeks. Politics. In our family, we lost a grandchild four weeks old. It's awful. There's still times when we look at the other little one and just, wow. God's so good on one hand, on the other hand, it was a big loss. Four surgeries, five if you count two with a bilateral knee replaced in two years. This wasn't fun. Then I stepped back and thought, you know what? I probably do need a sabbatical. <laughs> I'm nuts. Reflection. But here's what I'm declaring. The Lord always leads us out. Always leads us. This isn't about a pity party. This is about the Lord leads us out. No matter what you're going through. Because some of you journeyed. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just Debbie and I. It wasn't, it wasn't just us. It was all of us. And the Lord leads us out. So reflection can be good. Uh, Hebrews 13.8 is still relevant. The same God that brought us through the year of 2000 is the same God that is with us yesterday is the same God that's with us today. The same God that <laughs> when we've had to work through any kind of staff unrest as we did in 2020 is the same God that sees us through today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that led us through 2008 and the economic crash and we were ready to break ground for this building, ready to put a shovel in the ground and had it scheduled for March and all of a sudden the, 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 the wheels fall off the card and everything's turning upside down in the economy. Everybody remember 2008? I know some of you don't, but we do. We had to put everything on hold. It, the same God that brought us through that is the same God that will bring us through whatever we go through today. Listen, I want to declare it. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he brought me through yesterday, he'll bring me through today. If he brought me through yesterday and I can have confidence in today, he will bring me through tomorrow, no matter what we face. Can we all give him praise for that? That's a big deal. Yeah. It's good to take some, it's good to take some time away. It's good to reflect. But it's, it's also good to, uh, to build stronger family relationships. We've traveled. Oh, Lord, Debbie's been in seventh heaven. We were in Colorado for a week. Got to take the whole family. Ten, eleven of us. Very expensive, but anyway, we went to Colorado. We made memories. We did sleigh riding. We did sledding. We did snowmobiling. Went all the way up to the uh, equator. Not the, what do you call it? 
Continental Divide, equator, what am I saying? I need another sabbatical, I'll tell you that right now. I'm as bad as Steve. We went snowmobiling. They went skiing, I didn't. Debbie and I were smart. Had a great time in Colorado. I mean, those kids from the senior to the youngest were just special moments with all of them. We uh, went to eastern North Carolina, hung out with some dear friends there. Then we went to western North Carolina, hung out with our oldest son, who couldn't make the trip to Colorado with us because of all they got going on and had some great time with them. We went to Florida, spent some time in Florida while you all were up here in the cold that week. (laughs) Went to New Mexico, did some business there. I had to, a little bit, not much, just a little bit. And, uh, but also spent some time there to kind of shut down a little bit. Went to Sevierville this past week. We've been on the road quite a bit. And it was good to, the, to have the family together and take some time away. And another why, um, thirdly, to rest, to back up too. We visited a couple of other congregations and um, downloaded pressure. It was good to not have the pressure of speaking every week and teaching every week, and it was good. And then I want to say to evaluate rhythm. To evaluate rhythm. In 44 years of ministry, we've never done this. I'm not, I'm not patting myself on the back for that. I'm just, just, I, I've not been the type that felt like I needed it. It's not about being macho. It's nothing to do with that. And I, and I found this out. There's some things about sabbatical that I may do in the future, but there's some things I will not do. Um, I found out I'm a sprinter and not a marathon runner. And some of you may disagree with this. I don't need an email or a text, or I don't need to see a counselor over this. I know myself. I'm a sprinter. So what I'm going to work on doing and talking to leadership about is running hard for a number of weeks and then take a few days off. Run hard for a number of weeks and take a few days off. Because after about four weeks, this gets tough. If you, move, if you really believe what we're saying when I say I call your family and you're eight weeks away from your family, that's not easy. I can't pick up the phone. I can't call somebody to pray. I can't lean on somebody. I'm a people person. I love being around people. Some people draw energy from that. Some people go, I can't stand being around a lot of people. Wears me out. Certain sons that I won't name and myself gain energy by being around people. My dad was that way. And so we're all geared up differently, right? So we have to customize times of rest to fit ourselves. Does that make sense? Rest is a good thing. Secondly, I learned through sabbatical, it's good to lean on team. I kind of feel like when I left on vacation as a little boy, not a little boy, 10, 11 years old, my dad and mom made me so angry. And they scheduled a trip to North Dakota, Minot, North Dakota of all places, because they had friends there and they wanted to see the Northwest Bible College in those days. Dan was part of that. Greg Rush, several in the congregation went to school there. And my dad had friends there, and he wanted to see these friends. So they scheduled, made commitments about doing certain things when they were there. I remember they had a flood that year, and it was a mess, and I was a young boy. And they made me miss a very important baseball game. We were undefeated that year, and we were, we were on the verge of, and by the way, we went undefeated. But anyway, we were undefeated, and I felt like, that's not the time to miss. And they got messed up with the schedule, but because of their commitments, investment, they said, you're going. I begged and pleaded to not go. I wanted to stay with some teammates. I had friends in the church. Some of them are in the congregation this morning who played, one of them in particular played on that team. He's here today. And I didn't want to go. And my mother, <laughs> I love her to death. There's no reasoning with her. So I had to go. And I was so upset. I'm not trying to, I just felt the burden of carrying the team. You ever felt that? Not that I was braggadocious. I, could, I was a cleanup hitter. And I felt I was going to be missed, and here they are playing the toughest team of the year, and I've got to be out. My dad taught me that responsibility. You carry your weight. I think it's a good lesson for all of us. Carry your weight. And I felt that burden as a kid. I didn't want to leave. I felt like if we lose, I can't do anything about it. And I carried that as a kid. We go on the trip. I remember 
my mother would not allow me, and I don't know why to this day. Uh, she never would answer me. She wouldn't allow me to call back and figure out if they won. She wanted me to be removed from that. We're going to enjoy ourselves, blah, 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 blah. She's probably tired of my dad's coaching and all the summer schedules and all of that. She wanted to break away from all of that. So we come back, and you know what I found out? We won. The team won without me. You know what I feel like? The team won without me. And I'm thankful. Thankful we can count on people. And thankful, thankful we can know that they're going to do the job. They're not going to be lazy. They're going to do the job. I thank God for the team. Can you, can you let the team know that we appreciate them? I mean, they really carry things up. It's key. And it's a good thing when they win without you. It really is. My appreciations to all the staff. It's good to be on a team. And then the roles. They understood the roles. And tonight, you're going to, many of you, not all of you, but some of you, others of you will be in another room putting jigsaw puzzles together and playing games. You don't give a rip about the, the Super Bowl. Uh, if Jesus tarries, I know where I'll be. Uh, I'd rather you didn't talk to me when I'm watching the game. But you are going to watch. Some of you are not going to understand what you see on the screen, but I guarantee you when you see 11 players out there in the field, every one of them know their role. And if one breaks down in their role, this quarterback that's getting all the praise because he made a great pass, you just let that offensive lineman back do something he shouldn't do, and the quarterback ends up smashed in the ground, he'll start thanking God for that big offensive tackle up there on the line that has a role to play. And the team never wins with just one person. You have to understand the roles. And I think there's a great example of that. I, saw, I think also they take responsibility. If you don't take your responsibility, if you don't hit the weight room in the summer, if you don't, do, if you don't take, spend extra time studying playbooks and eating right and doing everything, they invest millions of dollars in these players, you better do it by the book. Some people think they just walk out there. And you, you have no idea. Playing a little bit of college will, 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 will wake you up. That's a whole other level in high school. You better get your stuff together and you have an assignment. You better know what that assignment is or you won't be on the team. That's just the way it is. Don't matter how many, how many trophies you want. It don't matter if your mama gets mad because you're kicked off the team. None of that matters in college. It doesn't matter if she goes and talks to the coach. It's not peewee football anymore. It's about business and you do your job. There's understanding roles and taking responsibility and so, I'm so thankful that we have a team that does that. And they do it with excellence. And then finally, it's good to reset vision. Since COVID, I'm realizing it's time to transition from reflection to direction. From reflection to direction. We've had some conversation with the trustees before I went on sabbatical. And we're talking about some, just, just throwing some things out. That we, we need, if we, if we move forward in certain areas, we're going to need leadership to buy in. It's a reset time. Am I making sense? Reset. The word is reset. And I think there's six things I've been working on as it relates to the Westmore family's future. I'm not going to get heavy into vision and all that. That stuff has to play out over time. But I will tell you, there's times that things have to be tweaked. Things have to be rearranged, relooked at, revisited. That's okay. And first of all, I think we need to learn how to become contagious Christians again. Becoming contagious matters. Every Christian, under the sound of my voice, whether it's media or in this room today, we need to evaluate ourselves. Are we really being contagious or are we being repulsive to the world? And if we're being repulsive, we better know why. What does it mean to be a contagious Christian? It matters. Starting next week, we're going to be launching He Gets Us. He Gets Us emphasis. Jesus came to this world and He was contagious. He was contagious. He rocked the world. He changed the world. Three years of ministry. No social media, by the way. None of that. So becoming a contagious Christian, what does that really mean? I want you to take a quick look here at a video. I'm going to call it up just a second, but here's the deal. When you watch the Super Bowl tonight, if you do, you're going to see a couple of times he gets us ads, video. 
Why? Because we've partnered with other churches across the nation. There's only two of us that we know of, I think, in East Tennessee. I hope I'm saying it right. And Westmore is one of them. You'll see it in, I think, there's a number of billboards already. I just heard the other day from Barry. There's a number of billboards in town. You're going to see He Gets Us. HeGetsUs.com. He Gets Us. And we are part of a movement that is going to say it's time to reach the world for Jesus. What can we do to reach this world for Jesus? You're not going to do it by trying to get people to join your political party. You're not going to do it by voting in the right Congress. Jesus needs to change the hearts of people in our nation. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. So we got to figure out how can we become contagious with the, the, listen, if you claim to have the spirit of God in you, you ought to be contagious. If you're not, there's a reason why. We're called to be salt and light, and that's enough of that. So next week, we're launching this. He gets us campaign. Watch for it in the Super Bowl tonight. We're part of it. And we've got some business people in the area, that, and some in our church that are a part of this, and they've invested heavily. We're invested in this. And it's not just another program. We're going after it. Um, Look at the video. This is just one, one little video. There, there'll be many videos that will be will going out all over the internet as we, as we work together this program. Show us that quick video. Hate is loud. It uses all its breath and then some to shout its selfish causes and to spew its vile venom. It's obsessed with division and distress. With its gain and its success at another one's expense, hate is loud. But love is louder. It is patient, it is kind, it is gentle, but it is strong. But it's a different kind of sound. It doesn't shout or raise its voice. It's love's whisper that is loud. A whisper like a song or like the rushing of the wind. It reverberates and resonates, it amplifies within. Love is louder. Give the Lord praise. Love is louder. Love is louder. We are going to do some evaluation as we move into this political season. We need to check ourselves. Are we loving? Or are we spewing division and hate? Being a contagious Christian matters. We'll work on this all the way through Easter as a body. God's got us. Does he not? He identifies with us. He gets us. Secondly, content matters. Biblical illiteracy, we're not backing off on that. Some things need tweaked. We have talked about, we have talked about and talked and talked about Bible characters, We've, at the beginning of the year, the last several years, we've read sections of Scripture. Many of you have come in a community Bible reading. We've, we, we, we are doing our best to get up to par with biblical illiteracy, illiteracy. We need to eradicate that. It should not be in the church. Well, we have to have fun and there's glitz and lights, but God doesn't care a whole lot about your lights and your glitz and your dance as much as he cares about the content that you're getting from the head to the heart. Let's give the Lord praise for the word. Yeah, yeah. And so here's what what we're going to be working on this summer. I want to dive into the declaration of faith. I want to dive into the core values, the core doctrines that that are based on the word of God and that every believer needs to get there. It's not about legalism. It's about the core doctrines that we need to get our arms around. We need to understand why we believe what we believe. Can we say praise the Lord for the word of God? We'll talk about it. Yeah. Content matters. Covering one another matters. I had an issue as a result of social media that was brought to my attention as the sabbatical was starting. It's taken time. It's taken stress. Some of you have had, and I've not responded to a lot of it, wanted to know what's going on. Some of you have asked because you've heard it. Somebody attacked in our body on social media, misrepresented, completely misunderstood, and slinging stuff all over the place. I'm so sick of that. I'm sick of that. And if we can't find safety in the church, and if we can't find somebody to cover, we can't cover one another, we don't need to even be playing church. We're about covering one another. We are family. We're family. You pick on one, you pick on all of us. 
If it's something that it's, needs to be dealt with, we deal with that internally, but you don't deal with that on the, you're not going to pick on a Westmore member on the outside. I'm not meaning to be tough guy. I'm just saying, if I'm part of a church, I expect you to cover me and I will cover you. Amen. Covering matters. So as we navigate and work through those kind of things, we need to be asking, what does that look like? What does it look like in our church? It's made me more aware than ever before that we're living in a different day, folks. We ought to get our head out of the sand. And folks can go quiet because they have political agendas or they bring things up because they have, I'm tired of politics. It's time to do the right thing, the right thing. And if it's still the right thing, let's do the right thing. Covering matters. I've heard some great messages that were in this pulpit the last few weeks. I think starting with Justin, talking about the body, talking about how we need one another. Do you need the body? By the way, you might be real aggravated with the church, but do I need to remind you it's the bride of Christ? It's not perfect. It has spots and wrinkles, but it's still the body of Christ. If, you, if, you, if you're really upset at the church and I want God, but I hate the church, you better take that up with Jesus because what you're saying is I don't like his wife. It's time to step out and talk about those kind of things. Community matters. We've got to continue to strengthen our community relationships. We need the community. We are not an island on our own. We have partnerships in our community. We don't need to back off. We need to invade. We need to work through community partnerships to be able to find ways and creative ways to get the message of Christ out. Family covenants matter. In keeping with our We Are Family, All Generations emphasis, we'll be adding a preschool this summer. And I don't know that I'm out here too early with it. I guess it doesn't matter. Everybody should know it anyway. The leadership knows it. And um, child care, I want, and I know our children's pastor feels strong about this. We want to disciple our children. And we want to start younger. And we want them to know the word of God. And that's, I'm talking about the preschool age. And that's what, let's give the Lord praise for our kids. We've got to get after our kids. Yeah. Family covenant. Your relationship with your, empowering, the church empowering, releasing resources to try to help so that we can do a better job together. And lastly, clear vision matters. Clear vision matters. We got to reset some things, tweak some things. I want to see debt reduction. God's blessed us. Oh, we're making our payments. God's so good. But wouldn't it be wonderful to just unload debt? It's time to unload the debt. We'll talk to you about that as the year goes on. Fiscal responsibility. What do we do on our campus? Is there anything we need to do in the future? What is the, what is the Lord saying about the future? We've got an autism campus we're breaking ground for. I think Kyle's managing that project. He had meetings while I was out, out of the loop, and he said that there's, I think they're looking to break ground in July. Or they've already broke ground, but looking to... So you're going to see trucks and bulldozers on the campus working the back part of the property because the autism campus is getting ready to launch. Can we give the Lord praise for that? That's, that's our kids. That's our kids. Yeah. I want us to prepare our hearts for communion. Family. Family tells the same stories over and over and over and over again. My grandkids, we were in East, Western North Carolina, and my grandson Jensen wanted to hear stories that his dad's told him that happened with Papa and the family years gone by families repeat stories now the funny thing is sometimes they get embellished but did you know Jesus said do this in remembrance of me and do it often tell the story over and over and over again it's no small matter that Jesus went to a cross we're getting ready to enter into that Holy Week season. That ought to be our Super Bowl. Oh, roughly, I don't know what it is, a few years ago it was 28 million people watched the Super Bowl. Everybody thinks that's a big deal, and it is. But can I tell you, over the last few years, several years, well over 2 billion people celebrate Resurrection Week and Sunday all over the world. It's no small matter. We need to look for ways to celebrate it because our Lord got up out of the grave. 
That's a story that ought to be told over and over and over and over and time and time and time again because he got up. The story. So as you come to the table, I know how some of you are. You sit around the table and those stories get brought up. Dad tell the story. Grandpa tell the story. They want to hear the story. A question comes up. That's a leading question. I know when my kids do that or grandkids. A leading question that wants to get me into the story. It's no different with the family of God. We need to tell the story over and over. Family also not only tells stories over and over, they come to the table often. Families come to the table. My mother felt so strong about this. It probably was the number one issue between my dad and mom because he'd always try to protect me. He was a coach and loved ball and all of that. And my mom would get tired of football season, basketball season, baseball season. You're never home and we need time around the table because that was our devotion time. That was our time we talked about the Lord. Mom was more spiritual than my dad. Dad, I'm kidding. Anyway. Coming to the table is important for family, and it's important for this family we call Westmore. Family tells stories. Families come to the table, and families eat together. We eat together. This is a wonderful, spiritual, symbolic, powerful thing that we've unpacked in years gone by, and we'll do it again. We'll continue to tell it. But I think even eating together on Wednesday night is pretty important. When you get to hang out, we get to see one another in a different light. We get to celebrate being family together.